What's up, Control Freaks, and welcome to the Control Freak Podcast. I'm your host, Les Alex, and today we have on Bryce Morgan. He is the person who invented, who is the architect of Lay Down Arms, Azorius Control in Pioneer. Super stoked to have him on. Bryce, how's it going? Good, well, how are you? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Super stoked to have you on. Thanks for being on. Um, but before we get into this uh, spicy meatball of a deck list you have here <laughs> and talk about Lay Down Arms, of course, and talk about you as a player, uh, let's jump into the housekeeping before you know we get into it. So first up, there were no new patrons this week, but if you enjoy the podcast, you may... Uh, and you want to help support it directly, you can head on over to patreon.com slash less Alex. And for less than a dollar an episode, you can help support the content directly. Every patron receives control freak stickers along with other perks based on which level you join at. And as a reminder, the podcast can be found on Apple podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, basically anywhere you download your podcast and make sure to head on over to Apple podcasts give it a five-star review, say a couple of kind words about the cast if you enjoy it, or head on over to Spotify, give it a five-star. They don't have a little expert where you can say something nice, but give it a five-star review. It definitely helps. And make sure to check out my articles over on quietspeculation.com. I have uh, two pieces over there currently, and my third one will be coming out Tuesday, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, and, of course, if you want to chop it up with me personally, Hit me up on Twitter, at Les Alex. Uh, join the Discord and uh, watch me stream on twitch.tv slash Les Alex Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Central and hit up the YouTube channel. We are streaming this on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. So shout out to everybody watching right now. Make sure to like and heart if you're watching on Facebook and uh, YouTube. Um, otherwise, feel free to chop it up in the comments section. Okay. Housekeeping over with. The annoying part is done. <laughs> All right. So before we get into how you created this behemoth of a deck list that you showed me tonight, um, and before we talk about lay down arms and Azorius control and pioneer in general, let's talk about let's reel it back a little bit and talk about your background as a player because uh, you know we uh, want to get to know you a little bit. <laughs> um, so how did you start playing Azorius control? So I actually didn't play Magic at all. I like looked at one of the Vehicle Rush Challenger decks. I started playing in like Guilds of Ravnica, Ravnica Legion's time. And I watched some Channel Fireball videos and I watched KCI. And oh, wow. And so that was while I was down between. I didn't know anything about the game. I was like, these both look cool. Jace is sick. Um, oh, yeah. And then I remember Jace I think. He's definitely sick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, best card ever. Um, but Matt um, Nass said that Mox will probably get banned. I was like, okay, I'll just buy Blue White. And yep. got the whole deck. And then a week later, I played in my first Comp Aerial event. And I lost to Bump in the Night, Burn. And uh, but it was it was great. So You hate to see uh, it. <laughs> Bump in the Night, Burn. So that was modern, obviously. Um, KCI, a deck that, uh, yeah, came and went. I actually like that deck. Um, cause that's just how my brain works. So that's super funny that you say that was a deck that kind of you, you, you were interested in potentially playing, uh, weird how control players minds work. Cause it seems like, at least for me, I like combo or control. I don't like mid range slogs. I don't like doing any of that, but that's super interesting. Um, so currently though, what is your favorite format? Probably it's close as I enjoy playing modern more, but I think I, I think it is modern. Like I hate running six; it forces a, the worst game action in the world, which is like tapping out. But yeah, other than running six, I, I still think I enjoy modern more. Just the cards are more powerful, and and every game feels so close. That's fair. Oh yeah. Um, and then, what, in your opinion, currently is the best format for control? It's it's gotta be pioneer. Like it, it's let's go. It just it, every is, guest I have on says like one person will say modern, the next will say pioneer. 
back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just so good. And like the threats you have are on par or on par. with the other threats and even though the interaction isn't the best, it always does more than one thing. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, modern your counter spell just counters, but like yeah, <laughs> pioneer, like your counter could replace itself or it can like, you know, gain life or untap lands or, you know, do a bunch of crazy different stuff. Copy spells, bounce spells on the stack. Like there's so oh, much yeah. stack manipulation and stuff. And I just think that that's a good place to be. Oh yeah. And you're not constantly under threat of just dying on turn three. I mean, yeah. you are against like Grease Fang or whatever, but like not as consistently. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Which is uh, definitely a good spot to be if you're a control player. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have anything else you want to add to your background in terms of like just how you maybe how you pick picked up? You know, you said that you basically just started playing. You went straight yeah. into so you went straight into competitive <laughs> tournaments. Yeah, um, I just kind of like I played a couple other games on like I played like Yu Gi Oh a bit and Hearthstone and like. I thought magic was cool and I've always yeah. liked the really slow Hearthstone decks. And so mm-hmm. I was like, well, if I lose enough, I'll learn enough. And then just kind of keep trying to think of every single thing I can do every single turn and just kind of like have the building blocks in motion and just trying to build, 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 learn, learn, learn as much as I can. And this deck is like, there's so much learning, like every decision oh, is yeah. so important. And like, if you have like Grease Fang, you know, you might have like, 20 decisions and you made like four of them wrong but like with control you can have like 200 yeah get 10 of them wrong you still lost because you lost the wrong you were on the wrong 10 and that's right. just so good it feels it feels good when you win and when you lose like it's always your fault kind of thing yeah no exactly and uh before we jump into uh you know lay down arms and stuff i do want to point out some of your mtg accomplishments uh so obviously uh, you you created the uh, lay down arms version of the deck. Um, what? How do I phrase this? What made you want want to try that specifically? And when did you realize like, oh snap, this is actually cracked. <laughs> this is very good for this deck. Because like, on the surface, it seems like a sweet card for like you know a white weenie deck. Mm-hmm. Um, I I did see it and be like, holy smokes, this could be super good. Obviously, you have to adjust your mana base quite a bit, but uh, yeah, what it, you know, if you want to take us through that, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the way I really like to play the game is like a ton based on play patterns. I feel like once you know all the play patterns of decks, it becomes a lot easier to kind of navigate, especially when you're playing something like control. And yeah. so, in my opinion, like when your deck is full of absorbs and full of at the time like portable holes like you have these games to where like you're playing against red black and you have like a double sense your hands like wandering emperor like three lands of five fairy and you're like cooking but then you know get super late in the game and they have you know like two man lands out and you had to burn your marches on Children's, and now they have right <laughs> children. You're like, oh, sick, these portable holes are horrendous. And so, yeah, that... yeah, por- portable hole always felt like just it, it feels like how uh, faithful absence feels now, yeah, 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 if that makes sense, yeah, yeah, and it plays into everything too. Like, it plays in the K command, it plays into like you know, it is plays into a lot. It's really just a card I'm not crazy about, and so because of that, I was like, okay, well. Let me do the math, uh, you know, and math wise, like, I think I played like 17 ish planes at the RC. And if you resolve a date, like in your top 20, I think you have like an 86, 90% chance to have six planes. Yeah. Which is a deluge. There's a deluge, of, you know, five draw steps. And, and so with that, like, it, it helps not only stop the bleeding when these decks have their fast starts, but. Yeah you know how your resources are going to trade. And so you can let that elf on turn one live if you're on the play because your sensor can counter the Kiora, your absorb can get the Karn and the Cavalier you don't care about because now you have your laid on arms or that like all growth troll to kind of bait out some interaction. Like you, you know how that exchange ends, but it's day one of a format. You can't, people aren't playing around laid on arms. They're prepared for like all these, right. Two mana counters and portable holes. <laughs> right. So they run out their elves. 
and I'm chilling because the turn three calf, like the turn four calf, you know, it's awkward, but like, you know, I started 20 for a reason. You know, we both started 20. We're not starting right. seven. Dude, so late on arms really can just beat the brakes off of these decks that like are trying to run like, you know, a cab on turn six, late on arms, one mana versus right. like March or just six. So they, their double spell is you know so, so painful for you. Oh yeah. And yeah, that that's one thing too. Uh, it trades so well with, it, it trades up on mana, which is like really important for control decks. Mm -hmm. You know, like we were talking about before the cast, uh, how much I love uh, change the equation. Uh, worst case scenario, it trades evenly. Best case scenario, I mean, you're hitting uh, just, it, I mean, so much value. Yeah. You're hitting a six drop, basically. You know, Storm the Festival is a card that uh, is very good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, change the equation. I love that card. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean... I, I, I love the explanation there. Um, but talking, speaking of your other accomplishments, uh, you're the last person. Is this such a, I'm so happy you put this on here. because It's so funny. You're the last person to win an SCG uh, with Snapcaster Mage. Uh, and you only lost a single game? Yeah. So what? It, was, it was in Syracuse. And um, <laughs> there was a 5K in Pittsburgh that, on Friday, I played Kahira and got waxed. But right. then um, sometimes, like, in, in competitive events, like, I'll go on these, like, weird winning streaks. Um, so hey, we don't – we, we take those. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So, <laughs> like, in Syracuse, um, uh, I lost, the game was in top four against Creativity. But um, anyway, in Pittsburgh, the first day I played Kahira – and didn't like it. And then one of my friends was like, well, why are you kind of being wimpy about this? Just play Snap. You, you know, you've talked about it, Wafo and everything. Like, just play it. And I was like, okay. And yeah. um, I got fourth in that one because I could beat the first four color, or I guess technically the second of the day. But the third one was just too much. Sure. I took way more Cavern Souls playing like um, um, Titania and a whole bunch of stuff. So um, that one, I was like, okay, went a little bit short. And then so Syracuse came, played the Snapcaster again, didn't just swap the, the 30k, and then the 5k came along. It's like I just I really, really want to win. Um yeah. and just try to do as much as I can and played against four color a few times. And I like that matchup. I always like that matchup. I know that's probably the scalding hot hot take of this entry. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. That's the clip. Time. That's the clip. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I loved it and I just kept on pushing. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh Oh man, I wish Snapcaster Mage was more playable in modern. Uh maybe they'll print it into standard. We get to play with it in Pioneer. That'd be hot. <laughs> I would love that. Or like the RC promos being Snapcasters, like they're kind of like secret way to be like, oh, now we brought down the price a little bit. Like right? now you really want to play Pioneer, like blue blue deck pioneer. Oh yeah. Literally. Um so also uh you have the same amount of RCs. As you do R RC invites, as you do RCQs played, how many? So it was just four. So I won. Just the, four. <laughs> so awful. it was technically like um, like store RCQ. So since I won Syracuse, I had my invite. And then the first RCQ I played in was at um, my home store in Harrisonburg. And nice. then it's always it was, nice to have home court advantage, you know, home field yeah. advantage. <laughs> oh, it was nice. And I lived like two minutes walking at the point. Oh, so my God. Walk for two minutes, one. Sleep one in, back. like, just get to um, sleep in your own bed and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then the RC happened, got another invite through there. And then for the third season, lost the first CQ, won the second one. That's dope, dude. Oh, yeah. That's like my SCG open top four mm -hmm. was it like literally 10 minutes down the street <laughs> so that's oh it. man yeah home field advantage is a very real thing in magic though for mm -hmm. sure um also also i gotta this is just funny um <laughs> you hard casted shark typhoon seven times in one event <laughs> that's that's funny <laughs> it's it's a wing edition, you know. Hey, that's, some... that's a that's a feather in the cap, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and in a mirror, it's about this might be horrible to say, but it's about you know, 
when you do that, they're shaking in their boots. And then you do the second one, like, oh, this guy is like kind of full of himself. Then you do the third, and you're like, yeah, that's lights out. Like, I'm scooping. Like, yeah, nice yeah. one. On to the next. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get into kind of, I would say, the, the, the meat and potatoes of today's uh, episode, which is uh, we kind of already talked about, like, why you you are decided to play lay down arms. What are your thoughts about it right now? So I still think the, the format has sorry, not to interrupt, but like the format has developed a little bit since uh, the set came out, yeah. obviously. And uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on it currently? I, short answer. I still think it's like baseline good. Um, yeah. Some of the things that I think it suffers from is like Phoenix was a deck, for example. And while in late arms against Phoenix kind of plays around them playing to the board or the original post board threats of like crackling drake so yeah. a lot of times like they play the crackling drake to try to gain advantage but since drake even though drake replaces itself it's right. answered by one minute card so the right. mana advantage you have could be still ahead on that exchange versus like they tapped out and did nothing and then you saw counters and like yeah. they're drawing a random card versus like you have gas um <laughs> That was part of it. I think that the evolution of the creativity decks in particular and the way red black has gone is especially, especially um, lessens the power of play down arms. So when I played it, there was no Liliana, you know, so yeah, you had two less cards and those are the, some of the best cards against us. That Oh yeah. Liliana. Ever since that card was printed has been a problem. It's such they got they got Liliana. We got Snapcaster Mage. Unfortunately, Liliana kind of beats Snapcaster Mage most of the time. <laughs> yeah, and like it beats the cards you bring in. So like yeah. you bring in Dream Trawlers and Angels, and Liliana's still cooking. Like it's yep. they're still ahead. Um, and, and that's part of the reason I think that Grease Fang as well. Like it's so hard when you have a sorcery in your hand and then kill him on turn three, and you're like, wow, this is, this is not good right yeah. there. Um, but it's clean, like you sacrifice utility lands for like just hyper hyper efficiency, and I feel like that serves a good purpose. But right now, I think it's lost so much power because like mono green, they're traded it out. Their love struck beasts for levelers and pelucranos, and that is crazy. Like yeah, the shift that deck got in like four or five months, like stone brain as well. Like you got yeah. so many more tools and like. We, we do have change, you know, change creation sick, but oh, yeah, it, it's no leveler, you know. Uh, yeah, no, and, and if only it could, if, if only it could, uh, <laughs> why doesn't it like colorless? Uh, like, why is it color faster? Well, that too, but I'm talking about change the equation. If change the equation was like counter red, colorless, or green, eight drops, I don't know, <laughs> like, Best I'm card. just, I'm just, you know, design, you know, create a, create a card, but. Um, I still am on lay down arms. Oh. I really like it. I do find myself cutting it more often than I used to, mm -hmm. um, you know, post board and stuff, but I still think the fact that I can play a one mana card mm -hmm. to kill, you know, their shielded or whatever is still just invaluable. And it's almost like it very rarely happens. It hasn't really happened in this format, at least. Sent and until lay down arms has been, you know, printed. Mm -hmm. So I'm still on it. Although we're about to talk about your your current list, and yeah. it is it is uh, it's wild. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know ch ch uh, sugarcoat it here. But yeah. um, first off, before we jump into the deck list, because I I do want to talk about that for quite a while. Um, what are your thoughts on you know, just pioneer in general right now, how well Azorius controls positioned and what you consider to be maybe some good matchups for control. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now, but no, you're good. You're good. Um, um so yeah. <laughs> so I actually think blue white benefits best from the decks that cancel out the other decks, if that makes any sense. So Let's take Incarnation, for example. Incarnation is a really good deck. I think it's kind of, 
50-50 against blue white, like especially since they're cutting sensors, like a lot of the lists are cutting sensors. Mm -hmm. So incarnate in their long games, like in a tournament setting, like if you ever have to go against two incarnation players, like you know, you got you gotta plan your bathroom time. You know, it's gonna be long, long, long. Oh yeah. And because of that, like incarnation does take some more specific slots on the board. But incarnation really can't beat mono green very well. Like that matchup is horrible for incarnation. So because of that, incarnation gets way less, mono green gets way more. And I think there are a lot of these kinds of situations in the meta, like especially with mono white rising popularity, like some of these variations, it's super favored against mono green. It's fairly favored, it can be against red black, absolutely decimates Lotus. So now mono white keeps green in check. But green keeping can keep red black in check. Yeah. And incarnation in check means that I'm most likely to target green, mono white, and then red black, which is red black. So it makes it a lot easier to target all the decks. So because of that, I think that blue white sits at like number three. Like I think mono green, red black, because of the most represented, I don't know if they're the best. I think mono green's top two. Yeah, I mean, what is, what is your thoughts on the mono green matchup with Azorius? Because, in my opinion, I think it is horrendous. Typically, I think it is like depending on the board, obviously, like that. That's a pretty sure. good board, and, and the deck construction, I guess. Right, but, right, right. How um, many how many changing equations we plan? Like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I think that matchup is pretty. 50-50, I think you're slightly favored on the play, slightly unfavored on the draw. The reason for this is because March is like gas, you know, on the play, because you're your mana equal with that elf exchange, and that's that's like its own huge variable. Yeah. And then you have you're on the draw, and like if you want to kill an elf, you gotta like you gotta pitch, and you can't do that. Yeah. Um, and you just gotta hope your interaction lines up well. Um I think that the reason I'm playing my version is because yeah. I won a 50-50 matchup against Mono Green, and I think that some of the most popular versions of the deck can't really do that as well, or the ways they do it are pretty easily exploitable. Yeah. <laughs> Someone in chat said, matchup's free. You're talking to Bryce. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, cool, yeah. I'm not going to get into, I know I put on here modern. I'm not going to talk about that today just because this is an extremely pioneer focused podcast. And I think uh, in a couple of ex episodes, we're going to have somebody on who's going to be real good to talk about modern. So um, we're going to not talk about modern this cast. So if that's why you're here, I guess we've wasted 26 minutes of your life <laughs> and I apologize for that, but um, so let's, let's talk about this behemoth. That is your Azorius control deck. I'm going to pop it up on screen here. Um, this is it. It'll be in the description below. If you are, uh, watching this after the fact, and it, I believe it's in there if you're watching on YouTube and on Facebook. So we are playing Kihira. So I like to see that playing the kitty cats. Um, you are not playing Brimaz, King of Oreskos, in the board. Playing instead three Regal Caracal. Mm -hmm. um, and the rest of this deck is just like your own concoction, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go over every single card here, but we're playing three Wanderer, three Wandering Emperors, two Teferi, one Elspeth Sons Champion, one Narset, or two Narset Parter of Veils. You're still playing Sensor. You're playing three marches, uh, no absorbs, and quite possibly the most spicy card in the entire list. You're playing two rewinds. We're going to talk about as to why here in a minute. You're playing two sunfalls and a farewell. You are playing two temporary two temporary lockdowns, four shark typhoons, and the mana base spice. We are playing three muta vaults. So this is spice from top to bottom, left to right. Any way you cut it, this thing is spicy as heck. If you want to just dig in and kind of talk about card selections from how much you like Elspeth to 
why we've got a two one split of some fall to farewell and of course rewind don't forget about rewind yeah, absolutely <laughs> Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah. So I'll, I'll kind of go from top to bottom. Um, talk about Kahira a little bit. Um, I like an extra <laughs> card. That's really – and a lot of tribal synergies, which I'll get into later. But Kahira is like the centerpiece of the deck. I think that every card should have intention. And oh yeah, if you're running a Vigilance 3-2 and that's your best bet, like you shouldn't play it. Because even if it's a free card, like what does that free card do? If it just is there to, you know, get sent to the Crash. grave. Or, yeah. Exactly, exactly. It, it gets literally killed the second you play it, basically. Every every game one. <laughs> yeah. And so I like to think my Kahira is not like other Kahiras, you know. Um, but I'll get more into that when I talk about the mana base. Um, yeah. And so the way the walkers are done is that Wandering Emperor is gained so much with Muta Vault. Talk about that with the mutable. Yeah, take I, that is that is like so good, such good synergy. That's a, that's what we call a combo. <laughs> yeah, and the it, the way it is able to do like against red black, I was playing against my friend, and like I have five men out, and so I activate one mutable block. It's game two, so like fatal push. I know it seems probably less. It's just a red black layer one card in hand out of four. Yeah, and block a blood type harvester, and then. Before damage, I can you know tap the Muta Vault, give the plus one plus one counter. Like I'm so ahead on the exchange is crazy, and then you know if I have Regal Caracol, a swing with it, it's like a five five now, five five life linker. Um, so it's yeah, Wandering Emperor is incredible. Um, oh I yeah, think Nars is really good um, against some of the blue decks and blue the blue white, even against uh, green as well on the play. I think it can add a lot because. Yeah, it oh. it stops Kiora. Exactly. Yeah, and <clears throat> and really that's how you they beat you, and you're very soft to that in this version with no laydown arms. Um, plus, you know, sorcery speed at impulse four is kind of bad, but when you can do it twice, and it's they can only draw one card a turn, it gets really go really quick. Um, yeah, and then two five fairy and the one Elspeth because I like playing to the board, especially. Yeah. Being one because it's not like they're dead cards. Because if I'm making three one ones, if there's a fatal push, I still got two. Um, and so having also a built in board wipe, it's the only way I can actually destroy a card in the whole deck. And so yeah. because of that, like able to clear the board, able to reestablish the board, able to just like. Make three one ones, eat a dread boar, protect five fairy. That's huge as well. Yeah. And it obviously it gums up the board against I mean game one, it comes up the board against like aggro decks. It kills basically every relevant green monster. Mm -hmm. Uh it kills Shieldred. So I mean, I like it. Uh Elspeth Sun's champion is like one of my favorite cards ever. So I definitely have nostalgia for this card. Uh it was it's in my board currently. Uh I, I'm I haven't I haven't pulled the trigger on putting it into the main deck yet, but Dude, I know we'll you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was gonna say you and um I've been seeing George Jabor's list. He's been playing at main, so I might I'll definitely have to try it, but yeah, that's good. Also post board too, like my, my board goes so wide. Um I'll explain a little bit more about that later, but I, I just love it so much. Um, so moving on, you are still playing two sensor here. So that's something that, as you stated earlier, uh, most control decks are moving away from this card. What's your thought process behind wanting to still utilize this? I think that cutting, so, so there's always a the big joke in Pioneer about like play draw, right? Like, you know, you bring the weight of dice to the event, you're going to win like 15% more of your games, mm -hmm. but oh yeah, <laughs> it, I don't think it has to be that way. And so by running all these two mana counters, like, yeah, you know, you're like Thalia on the draw, it sucks. But <laughs> the fact it replaces the fact that it can, it still just is a counter, right? Like, yeah, they, in open deck list, they're forced to respect it. In closed deck list, it gains so much equity because they play into it once. You're so ahead on that exchange. Um, because 
it lets me keep also kind of more aggressive hands because the mana base of the stack, like there are five colorless lands. It does get a little bit more risky. And so having this card, like, okay, you know, worst case scenario, it's like my got one in 25 to draw my third land. That's big. Being able to counter Fable on the draw, that's also big. And so... Yeah, Fable's just... Yeah, yeah. Counter on site. <laughs> yeah, and it's so hard. And so because of that, like, if you're playing against Red Black and they have heavy hand interaction in light lands, like, they might have to take a sensor, which is horrendous. Or they leave the sensor and it finds us into a threat. And so they might get landlocked and we have up on the lands and we're, I think, ahead on that exchange. Yeah, definitely. Um, also, you're still you're playing one Behold and two Memory Deluge. I'm on three Deluge. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Behold, the multiverse still has its spots where it can be, you know, a good utility but this is kind of like something that i don't know a month ago was pretty stock mm -hmm. um what's your thought process on the one still having the fun of behold yeah. so um i actually think these cards get a lot better with rewind and with mutable and so especially late in the game where if you're especially post board where the cards you're getting are way more efficient so like I'm playing against uh, uh, Red Black. And so now, instead of some of the awkward counters, like I have Divine Smites. And so now I can see these points where I'm on the play. I can afford to behold this card, sit on it for such a long time. And because the rewind, you're so ahead on mana. Um, mm -hmm. I'll talk more about rewind is just the best card. Oh, yeah. Ever. We're getting to it. Don't worry. We're, you know, I'm seeing some comments about rewind in chat and yeah. we're getting to it. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> And so because of that, I want something to do with my mana every single turn. Even if it's a little bit. And so I love Deluge. I think it is, it's one of my favorite cards printed in the past year. But it is not two mana. And yeah. being able to have, especially with Rewind, if you've ever foretold this card, if you have one Rewind, if you have Rewind, Divine Smite, uh, and a foretold card, like you have you're ahead because you get described to draw to and you have double interaction. So like even with four mana, having double interaction and card advantage is insane versus like, you know, oh, yeah. with Deluge, like you just look your top four, you get two, which is great. But if they've already established double creature, you know, they never have to double spell again. Yeah. And your, your interaction gets awkward. And then the ball just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling, especially when you're playing against a deck like mono green, like red, black, like, those blood tide harvester trespassers starts on the play you're like yo i'm about to die and like you know, <laughs> and you're, you know you're freaking out because you have a hand of like sensor temp lockdown uh land land five fairy emperor <laughs> and you gotta like ward discard for the the trespasser and you're, you're looking at me like what do i do right and, you know, can't really do anything um and so this way Gives me a bit of advantage. It plays super well with the Mutaball, incredibly well, especially post board. Um, and it lets you trade your lands more efficiently. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, makes sense to me. Um, moving on. All right. Here's the card. Okay. Here, here we are, folks. Rewind. So, for those that might not know and are listening, I do have it on screen for those watching, but Rewind is a four mana, two generic blue, blue for an instant. Uh, from, well, it's an uncommon. And it says, counter target spell, untap up to four lands. That's it. That's that's the card. Um, that's all you need. Uh, so explain to me, well, you kind of did a little bit there with, with Behold, but uh, explain to the folks why, <laughs> why we're playing this and okay. why you think this card is just nutty in this deck. Yeah, so... Um... I want to use red black as another example just because it's the easiest i think to explain this with so you're on the draw it's also this is going to be a famous theme throughout the deck is on the draw on the draw on the draw on the draw what do you do you're on the draw against red black you've got two mana up you're trying to like poker face as confident as possible like you own the world and you're playing in a deck with absorb and you have absorb in your hand you're like please 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 don't slam the fable yeah 
No, you have a light on arms. You have your light on arms, two lands, fable. And uh, you have light on arms, absorb. They're two lands of the field. The rest doesn't really matter. Right. And they play a fable. You look at your absorb. And you're like, wow, this is sad. And then you go to your turn and you lay down arms, the token, because without that, they get ahead. Yeah. And you still have two mana. You still can't play your absorb. <laughs> <laughs> Which means that you still are going to die by the shielded because you can't absorb it. And then you have to verdict the shielded away. And then they can do whatever they want still yeah. because you're tapped out. And so because of that, that's why I'm running all these two mana counters. So I'm running the sensors. So I'm running the extra march, um, the change the equation, the vetoes, um, the saw coming, or the foretell cards, because... Now, if you're on the play, it's still just a cancel. There's still something new with your mana. Yeah. And close deck lists, like you're playing on RCQ, you get to represent Absorb. They don't know what you have. Right. Um, but because you're playing Rewind, actually, you just get to wait. And the way that a lot of these decks, in my opinion, beat you is they double spell. Right. So playing against Grease Fang, you know, they can play around Sensor the same way they play Thotsy's, um, Thotsy's Grease Fang, right? Because, yeah. like, they play a Grease Fang. You have a sensor. You can counter it. They play a Thotsy's. You can't really – you kind of have to censor it. Yeah. Have, then they can't play the Grease Fang. Or you have to have, like, change – make the superior change. Like, and using double counter that early is so bad and so hard because then you just die to Chariot. Mm -hmm. So Rewind lets you play only two mana counters. So you always get ahead of the draw or ahead and you get to these points to where it is pretty impossible for them to double spell you because your rewind is still just a card trading with a card but now you have lands and because you're playing now four typhoons and yeah. four or excuse me three um can be four sometimes two um mana advantage spells yeah now you have, um seven copies of a card that either replaces themselves, generates value, or it, it always does two things. So it either right. adds two cards or replaces itself something to the board. And that is so huge because if they ever try to push for it more, then they get blown out the sensor. Then they get blown out by the make disappear. Like in this format, I think four equals three. Like no one, if you look at all the top blue decks right now, None of them are playing Pierce, or not a lot of them, I would say. Yeah, there's a yeah, I've seen a couple and it's been in and out of my decks, but yeah, typically you don't see it much. Yeah, dispute is getting way less. Um, but Narcissus Reversal is staying high. And I think Narcissus Reversal will continue to stay high as long as field and creativity exist in the numbers that they do, because mm -hmm. it has the opportunity to have so Reversal can have so much equity and you can be proactive. And the other cards, it's a lot harder for Dispute to be proactive in your control deck. Like, if you're playing five fairy hold up Dispute, like, you better hope. <laughs> you better <laughs> hope, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so because of that, like, all these decks are kind of pressured in to keeping the um, Narcissus Reversals that go less on the Disputes, um, less on the Pierces, et cetera. Your blue matchups are still pretty good. And, you know, if they have to burn a count on a rewind, the that's why you have three marches. Like, you can still exile that Fable token. Or that's why yeah. the board is the way it is with Triple Veto. Um, so that's kind of my feelings in, in the shortest way I can without talking to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, about, you're good. About the um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely super interesting. But, I mean... I think this is a very good case of like this deck is much more than the sum of its parts. And specifically this card feeds into, if you were to see a, if, if someone were to tell you, Oh, I'm playing rewind in my Azorius control deck and you are thinking, Oh, the stock Azorius control deck, why would you ever play that? But exactly the way that you have constructed this deck and you know, your reasoning behind it, I mean, you do have a ton of two mana spells. You've got Sensor, Change, Dovin's Veto, Make Disappear. Potentially, you do have one Saw It coming, which is like your true, you know, kind of cancel or whatever. 
um, but it can be two mana, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense. You know, being able to double spell, especially against red black, is like super important. Um, it's kind of a race to see who can start to double spell first, really. <laughs> um, but you know, it makes perfect sense. And this is a deck that, like, honestly, I'm gonna say this, and I might get torched in the comments, but it looks like a deck that Guillaume Wafatapa would make. That is like, because there's just so many cards that you wouldn't really think of to play anymore. Like the next card right here, Sunfall. Sunfall is yep. a card that I I tried uh, the first like week that uh, Mom came out uh, in Explorer, and I was just like, well, I, I think generally speaking, this card is very powerful. Like being able to you know, kill all their creatures. And then obviously the token is insane. Um, but overall farewell is the more power, like just does the, does more. Right. Um, but if you want to talk about why you're playing two sunfalls and one farewell, take it away. So, um, I, I want every card to kind of a similar theme. And so with the counter spells is I want to be able to double spell the whole time. I want to be able to represent simultaneously interaction combined with um advantage and so i want to make sure that all my interaction only exiles um i'll suppose only card that can destroy it and i think the exile is extremely um, important for a few reasons i think that the hedge against red black with kick commands and um Kroxa is important i think that the possibility of mono white having um Extraction specialist can be super, super mm -hmm. difficult. I think Mono Green having all these, you know, the, the troll going enchanting the forest is terrifying. That is oh, yeah. scary. And it's difficult to interact with as well. It is. Because you're getting, I mean, you're getting two for one. And so because of that, that's why I want an exile. And I think the threat that it generates after is actually the most important part of the guard because the amount of times that. This might just be my experience, but you know, you're playing against an aggro deck. You know, you you, you have your like two minute counter, land, 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 verdict hand. You're like, I just gotta live. I just gotta live. And then you verdict, and then they play two double drops or double two drop. And then you lose yeah, yeah, because you didn't have anything to recommit to the board, right? And the absorb that you drew into, for example can't play to the board either like you're playing it because it's an anti-aggro tool but if they're already on the board what does it do and you know it doesn't really do anything and so because of that you have the sunfall exiling everything creates a threat yeah. and to activate that threat it's two mana and well all the counters are even numbers so if you like if i'm thinking about my curve you know sunfall on turn five turn six now i have threat I can still have triple interaction mm -hmm. same turn. or with the mutal vaults now through my opponent's turn, I can have double threat, double interaction. And so because March is kind of like my odd numbered card, Sunfall's my odd numbered card, temporary lockdown, and Narsan my odd numbered cards. So the rest of the deck is even. Yeah. And so effects like Sunfall, the play pattern of always having a threat that's even after my odd numbered board wipe, so so powerful. And when none of the decks that care about um, can't be countered. It doesn't really matter. Like even against like band spirits, they can queller it. They can um, yeah. sacrifice the indestructible dude, but like self spirit, but like Sunfall gets around that. Phoenix doesn't really exist a ton anymore. Like it hedges so much against mono green. Like Red Black's K commands is supposed to be good against blue white, but because oh, of yeah. was exile based, you're like shatter, get back the blood tie that I censored. Which is right. horrible. Like that's so much mana, and so because you're like, especially post port, you know, you're playing all these go white creatures. Like, there's no five mana to kill a random token that you got for free and right. the blood tide harvester. Like, are they really winning? You know, right? I, I don't think so. So that's that's why I'm playing the card. I think it's incredibly good, and I think it's super super underexplored. Yeah, and I mean, uh, to your point, uh, wrathing. A mono green opponent that's got like um yeah just all their cards you have to exile so supreme verdict sometimes you like verdict and then they like find a land off cavalier or whatever and and the troll dies and flips into the yeah the, 
the enchantment or whatever. It's just like, oh God, it's just not good enough. That's why I like, yeah, exile effects, super important. Um, I actually farewelled my mono green opponent last night at my local and he was like, uh, he, he almost flipped the table on me. He's like, I hate that card. Ah, I mean, it was, you know. My dog, you're playing mono green. Like, yeah, but, <laughs> like, you know, um, but anyways, uh, Amiri's call. This is, uh, Actually, George has been playing this in his list. Uh, I mean, it makes sense with Narset. If you ever need to find a land, it's kind of a sneaky way to find a land. Um, obviously, creating the 4-4s four is super important in, in certain matchups. Uh, do you have anything else to say about Call? Yeah, um, originally in the deck, I had um, two C-doubles in the 75. Um, and the reason for this was because um, you can actually, if you have a... C double in your hand, and they have they need the so condition. If you don't mind, explain like explain what that card does. Yeah, so C double, <laughs> um, it's a two, it's two and double blue. Um, it can't the spell can't be copied, and if your opponent has eight or more cards in the yard, you get to do both. And so you get to copy <laughs> target spell, any spell, and then you also get to create a token of a creature, any creature. And so um, now that's spicy. <laughs> yeah, and so. With Lotus Field at one point, um, the top meta was kind of when it was like Lotus Field, Red Black, and Mono Green. Mm -hmm. um, and Greaston kind of went down for those, those couple weeks. Um, if you have one C double in your hand, one C double in the deck, and Narciss reveals in the deck, um, regardless of pile, you can actually combo, you can present lethal from any point um, on your opponent's turn. Because you can C double, target the ultimatum. Your pile becomes C double, reversal, typhoon. It doesn't matter what order. Um, the worst one for you is reversal and typhoon. Yeah. And so then when you reversal um the ultimatum, then they can't really do it again if they tapped out. If they do tap out, then the pile gets super different. But they yeah. did tap out for it. Um Typhoon, C double, um, and Amiria's goal. And though, so from there, um, doesn't really matter because since the mirror's call is so big, still casting the card, you get all these massive sharks and randomly you just have like 20 power on the board. <laughs> but you do need two C doubles in reversal to do. But I don't think field's enough to good enough to do that right now. If for some reason this Chandra version of field spikes, I definitely could see that coming back because also C double can stop mono green mid combo because when they cast their second karn you copy their karn copy their cav you get to wall your karn with their cav Jeez. and they can't change it anymore so it's <laughs> very very a lot of obscure things um but if those two decks for some reason rise to the top i think that's a very very good inclusion heck yeah um you playing tip uh, so one thing i do want to point out if you haven't noticed yet and you're listening, if you're watching, you know already. Uh, Bryce isn't playing laydown arms. The dude who, uh, you know, brought the deck to, you know, uh, created it. And it's, yeah. <laughs> what gives? <laughs> I mean, you kind of talked about it already. Um, but yeah, you're not playing laydown arms. <laughs> no, I ultimately. Tem temporary lock. So. Not to interrupt again. I'm sorry, but uh, temporary lockdown is, I'm assuming, part 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 of the reason this card is very good. Of course, against ugh, just so many decks right now. Um, but yeah, if you want to say why you're not uh, playing laydown arms currently, yeah. Um, this reason actually kind of shorter. Um, I love. I think it is underexplored when your lands are the cards that are trading. Because yeah, there's always the cards in our hands, and then we have a bunch of lands, and then it's like, oh, we lost because we draw too many lands. But what if that never had to really be the case anymore? Yeah. What if you could always trade your lands? What if you could always trade these other half of resources? Um, and so that's where the philosophy of the deck comes in. And because of that, I can't play Light on Arms, which just feels bad, but right. um, also Light on Arms is a sorcery. And when you play against Grease Bang, that... That is enough to just like really, or be on the dragon spino green and yeah. draw it later. Um, it is enough to really you 
you know, you gotta start asking questions. You're like, what do I do when I lose the classic pioneer problem of the die roll? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, and talking about using your lands, um, you are playing three Muta vaults, um, and two hall of storm giants. Now this is something with hall, obviously one or two pretty, pretty normal. Uh, you're playing one castle, one of both blue and white castles. So, uh, still two fields. And you already talked about kind of how having three colorless lands can be an issue. Um, and then Ottawara to round out your uh, utility lands. But yeah, talk me through Mutavault. Sell me on Mutavault. So um, <laughs> it's all types, which means that works with Kahira. And with the three Regal Caracol, it, um, it's a cat. Can't you tell, chat? <laughs> it is a cat. I, I mean, the cat looks a little, this cat looks a little scary, but you know, at a certain point, like, it is kind of a nice dreamland to like, you know, oh, you know, you have the Regal Caracol, you got the Kahira, now it's a 4-4 four, four with like Vigilance Life, like, woo -hoo. But, you know, especially against a lot of the decks, like, when you have a Vigilance 3-3 three, three for one mana, like, what deck can really actually answer that super well? Like, you know, uh, Creativity has Volcanic Spite, but sometimes they board some number of those out, like, you play against red black and push yeah suddenly like your best like creature removal, like you might have to keep pushing which against blue white like that is so <laughs> rough terrible <laughs> um like against mono green you don't get buried by the karn after your temp lockdown against grease fang you don't get buried by the liliana um and so mutable is your hyper efficient way to be able to deal with these walkers that normally you get buried by. Like, you know, Grease Fang especially, you know, they sit in the Sliliana, keep upticking it, and you're like, please, draw Divine Smite, draw something, draw something, draw something. Um, but if you go to Vault, you never have to worry about that. Like, you, they can't really afford to bring in pushes against Blue White as Grease There's Fang. no way. <laughs> the, exactly. Literally no way whatsoever. And because of that, the Muna Vault, you always have something to contest the board, and you always can offer a trade. So whether they take it or not, it's kind of irrelevant, but like um, you play against Blue White, you have more man lands. Your your lands do more than the late arm, arm stack will. Yeah. And so you play in the March, but a card still trades for a card, but you're, here's, you've already played. Here's a land. There's a card in their hand. And again, like, who's really ahead on that exchange? The guy with like one more, one less card in hand. And usually it's the one with one more in hand, I think. Mm -hmm. or, and so in a control game where the game's going so long, like if the two twos will make them both, you know, have to use it, then I, I think you're pretty ahead on that. And so in conjunction with the tribal synergies, always being able to pressure the board, always being able to represent so many decisions. And so you're playing against these decks, you're like, why is Blue White Guy playing Mutaball? Right. And like, no one can really board against it, right? Like, are you really prepping your deck to go against Mutaball Blue White? Yeah. You can afford to do that. Um, and so it really exploits that fact of the Pioneer Blue White decks are in two camps. And the third one, I think, truly with all my heart, is this one. And it's in its own little corner, far away, and like a little, you know, like a little uh, cat city. And so the little, <laughs> little cat city blue white is chilling and no one's really going to prep against it. And so oh, yeah. it's pretty proofed from the slight adjustments that the meta will take place because this deck, I don't think can really be targeted super well, except if there's for some reason, like a sudden surge of disputes of pierces. Yeah. I mean, Mutavault, you know, we were talking before the cast, uh, before your time in magic, there was, a player by the name of Ivan Flock, and he won a pro tour with uh, the best Azorius control deck that I've ever seen in standard, other than like Jace the Mind Sculptor. I mean, that that was a control deck, but you know, it was a blade deck, so whatever. But Ivan Flock won a pro tour with literally no win conditions, other than um, he had Jace Architect of Thought, and he had uh, Elixir of Immortality as a one of. And he had Mutavaults. He he would kill people with Mutavaults. 
that deck was awesome. So I have, uh, you know, this has been super secret tech for Azorius players for as, as long as for since that deck has been uh, popularized by Ivan Flock. So I have reverence for this card and I think it's super sick that you're, you're playing it. Um, and <clears throat> everything you're saying makes sense. I mean, you can of course buff it with wandering emperor. Yes. It's a cat. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a shark. <laughs> it's an yeah. angel. <laughs> and like, but um, in all seriousness, I, I think that this is super sick. I want to try that. I'm going to hundred percent playing this deck on stream uh, sometime next week. Um, you know, your, your sideboard. So I do want to talk about the, the spice in the sideboard. It's pretty, pretty stock other than two Reckoner bank busters. If you mm -hmm. want to talk about that and what matchups that comes in against. <laughs> yeah. So, um, there's also a common theme of the deck. Um, choose the magic number. Um, I don't like playing a three job as my alternative um, <laughs> thing. The reason for that is because, like, you generally bring it in against the decks, or I maybe mean, sometimes, occasionally, um, that play Liliana. And I never like being a, you know, play it, hope they don't have it kind of guy. That's just my preference. Yeah. That could be the correct thing, could not be, I'm not sure. Um, but um, because it's an even number, it's pretty good against some of the more decks like red black for example but it also is really really good against field because like five fairy for example like you play a five fairy and it plays in the needle and it plays in the hidden string so you can't really ever double spell and when you ult it you can't even exile the fields and yeah. so bank buster allows you to always hold up interaction but then if they never go for it you draw a card same with blue white that kind of effect is absolutely crazy and like how can they really interact with it? They can't really temp lock down it. Like they're not playing portable anymore. It's like the one time portable would be absolutely insane. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they don't really have a way to interact with it super well. And um, because of that, like it gives you such a head on the, on the mirror and it lets you have another way to deal with Narset, like the Narset lock, because you can always yeah. draw in their turn. And you know, eventually you can have a one, one to swim with. You can grow up, make a four, four, like, there's so many things you can do, again, to contest the board. Um, so I think the card's incredible. It's even against red, like, I talk about red black a lot because it's so It's a very good deck. Um, like, even when they K-Command, like, all your removal is exile-based. And if they shatter it, like, you can, it can replace itself. So, like, what can they really do with it? And then their like the cards they're bringing out are invalid, or excuse me, bringing in are invalidated. Your mirror gets a lot easier. Your kind of Drago combo decks that you're playing against, like Creativity Field, they always have to have a decision of do they go for it? Do I go for it? Do I not? Right. And with Nuna Vault, with Bank Buster, that's on like absolute overdrive of every single turn. They have multiple ways they have to go for it. And so many ways they just get punished because everything is too mana. Yeah, it it definitely. I mean, it makes sense, man. It makes sense. Um, you are playing three regal caracals, as I said before. Uh, just rounding out the sideboard: two two gusts, uh, one change the equation, two divine smites, one veto, one narset's reversal, two bank busters, as I said, two summary dismissals, three cats, uh, three regal caracals, and one extra. Elspeth Sun's champion. Yeah. Had to have it in the board too, huh? Had to. I wanted five effects that make three things on the board. Um, and if I can't have three cats, I want three humans. Absolutely. Soldiers. But no, uh, soldiers, yeah. Me. It could be, <laughs> um, I guess, cat soldiers. Even, but. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, awesome, dude. Well, do you have anything you'd like to add before we call it a show? I can't really think of anything. I love the deck. I genuinely think it's so incredible. Um, and I would say if like there's ever a card in Pioneer, I think that the most to its detriment as well, the way the competitive um, format or, or the way organized play is set up is that I don't think it really supports exploration and I don't yeah. think it supports creativity. Like the concept not the deck the concept like, not the deck <laughs> yeah, yeah. because yeah. 
it, it kind of the way the RCQs are is that it makes it to where you're kind of afraid to fail because like oh, oh yeah i have to play the version that i know does well because right. if i don't then like i might not take it to play in the rc with my friends or i may not get to do this and right. i think i haven't been playing a super long time like i've never played in a gp i never got to play in an invitational so like my experience is pretty limited in that regard but yeah. um i think that taking those chances will only benefit you as someone who like like a player but also benefits like the social groups and the people you travel with like if you travel in a car of four and you're the one that took a chance on something like now those three other people and you now can work together on something together yeah. and so when four of you are doing that at the same time then there's 16 different combinations of that same idea that can be done um and it just promotes like working together you know oh yeah like teamwork and i think that even though it's a one-on-one -on -one competitive game having that sitting yourself out there being like i might get absolutely bodied with this but i also might not and i might right. also you know break the format you know two three four five how many ever times um right you, you took a risk so yeah I, i'd say take more risks is my take more risks yeah no and uh kind of to your point Having a team around you, like, you know, we're not all show to Yasuoka out here. Like, we can't all just be, you know, testing ourselves, having a team. I think what led to my success back in 2014 was, like, um, just having a group of players that were all either as good as me, probably most of them better than me, and just playing every single day of my life, just jamming, no magic online. And, you know, I, you told me, I don't know if you said it on the cast, but you told me before you don't play any magic online or anything like that. So, but yeah, having a group of folks that just want to play a lot of magic and, you know, iron sharpens iron and you're going to yeah. all get better. Absolutely. So heck yeah. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Um, so mainly on Twitter. Um, it's, <clears throat> at bmorgs underscore mtg um i don't tweet a lot and i'm horrible at responding like really really <laughs> comically bad um so if i don't respond it's because i'm horrible at it i really <laughs> i love social but are, you, are your dms open if people yes, want to take this list and have like questions about sideboarding or whatever yeah, yeah i think they are they should be a check i'll be honest but I will check and they should be open and like any questions, anything awesome. like that, if anyone ever wants to leave. Uh, okay. Oh, so I'm seeing in chat, I got to ask, uh, is there anybody you want to shout out? I don't know. That's um, just, I would say um, my friends at Gamer Oasis, teammate, no way. Um, friend Evan Farrell, Kevin Andrade Jr. Um, <laughs> Victor Sansing, Nicholas Brown, Mason Furnish, Jordan Meyer, um, Brian P. There's a ton of people like, yeah from, you can't from, hit them all <laughs> no absolutely not there, there's just so so many people brand shiftlet um like and everyone and there's so many people to meet across the way especially in virginia like you go to some of these events and you'll see like a bunch of pros and and you know becoming friends with them or, or there's so many people to meet and oh yeah even though like a lot of my practice does come from like staring at my cars for five hours and like just theory, theory, theory. And then just my friends would be like, is this actually good or is this bad? Um, helps. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, before we call it a podcast, as a reminder, um, please, if you enjoy the podcast, head on over to Apple podcasts, give it a five star review in, in a, just a sentence of why you enjoy the podcast. If you're on Spotify, uh, make sure to give a five-star review. As always, you can find the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, basically anywhere that you download your podcasts. Additionally, I, on YouTube and Facebook, uh, if you want to follow me personally, hit up uh, Twitter, at Les Alex over there. I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook page too. Uh, Les Alex, comma, the control freak. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, check check out those spaces. If you want to support the content and the podcast directly, um, hit up patreon.com slash less Alex. And again, for as little as a dollar uh, 
less than a dollar per episode. Actually, you can support the content directly. Um, and there's different perks for different levels. Um, so it's uh, definitely a great way to support, or you can subscribe on Twitch. Of course, that's always an option. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for li listening and watching. If you're watching live, thank you so much. Make sure to like the video and comment <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube as well. And uh, check me out on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Les Alex, where I stream uh, Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Central. Unless I want to go get tacos with my my partner. <laughs> then, then sometimes we don't, I don't stream. <laughs> but uh, I'm extremely consistent over there, though. But uh, Bryce, this deck is awesome. Thank you. Obviously, you know, lay down arms. It was... Uh, such an innovation to the deck as well. So maybe, maybe rewind. What are you dubbing this? Rewind control? I don't know. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, all the names <laughs> are a little like, it's too many words. So hopefully I'll get, I'll figure out something. There you go. Um, but yeah, everybody, thank you so much. And uh, until next week, uh, keep spreading that Azorius propaganda. And I will catch you all on the flippy flop. Control freaks. Adios.